Greetings, and welcome back to the channel. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, Hollywood rapidly transformed to support the war effort, mobilizing resources and star power. Studios converted facilities for military use, and the Hollywood Victory Committee organized free shows to entertain the troops. Major stars enlisted, and the studios produced numerous patriotic films, propaganda films, and cartoons showcasing Hollywood's dedication to the war effort. But science fiction cinema was at a crossroads. Most films produced this year were made by smaller, lower-budget studios known collectively as Poverty Row. They made films on the cheap, written, produced, and released in theaters in only a few months. This was once again a year of the mad scientist, but also the beginning of sci-fi moving towards more patriotic themes. Universal once again led the way with their mix of genres. But to me, the most memorable films of the year came from war-torn France and Hungary, both dealing with time travel, a somewhat new idea to cinema, though not to literature. This year, we will see one sci-fi character fight for America and punch some Nazis, though nowhere near the level of patriotism seen in dramas and musicals. This year, Universal Pictures released the fourth film in the Frankenstein saga, The Ghost of Frankenstein. The film was directed by Earl C. Kenton, known for his work in horror films like 1932's Island of Lost Souls. Starring Cedric Hardwick as Dr. Ludwig Frankenstein, he'll also appear in Invisible Agent this year. I also looked at Hardwick's past work in Things to Come in 1936 and The Invisible Man Returns in 1940. Airhawks star Ralph Bellamy appears as Eric Ernst, and Lionel Atwill, who I'll discuss later in this episode, is probably best known to viewers of this channel as the Inspector from Son of Frankenstein. Bella Lugosi reprises his role as Igor. Lon Chaney Jr., who worked with the film's producer, George Wagner, won two films in 1941, The Wolfman and Mad Maid Monster, replaces Boris Karloff as the monster. Karloff was unable to reprise his role due to a scheduling conflict with his Broadway show Arsenic and Old Lace. And the B-movie horror actress Evelyn Ankers rounds out the cast as Elsa. Set as a sequel to Son of Frankenstein, the story follows Igor's quest to revive the monster and seek vengeance. He thinks he can get help from Ludwig Frankenstein. Initially planning to destroy the monster, Ludwig is persuaded by the ghost of his father to transplant a new brain into the creature. A brain from a good man instead of one that is evil. Of course, Igor has other plans. He wants to transplant his own brain into the body of the monster. Things don't go as planned, of course, concluding in a fiery end for several characters. The film faced budget constraints, but utilized advanced special effects for its time, especially in scenes depicting ghostly apparitions and the surgical procedures on the monster exploring the ethical dilemmas of pushing the boundaries of science and the consequences of tampering with life and death, a recurring theme in this series. Asking if you can actually change a person's personality by just switching out their brain. Eric Taylor's early version of the script included Basil Rathbone's character from Son of Frankenstein and was criticized by the Hayes Code because of extensive violence. W. Scott Darling would take over for Taylor to create the final version of the script that lessened the violence, removed Rathbone's character, but kept the monster's interaction with the little girl. Despite mixed reviews, more sequels would be made, including House of Frankenstein in 1944 and many others. Its portrayal of the scientific hubris and the tragic figure of the monster continue to resonate in popular culture, even today. 
The New York Daily News called the film, quote, horrid, not horrendous, and horribly boring. Even though a lot of good players do the best they can with the dreadful material, unquote. I like the actors, but I wish they had a better script to work with. Cheney as the monster, who has now regressed into a different character, couldn't replace Karloff. It does feel like a B-movie as compared to the earlier versions, and the romantic subplot just felt off. Everything, especially the makeup for the monster, looks cheaper. But I can't blame Universal for saving money on the fourth film in the franchise, as well as cutting back cost during the war. It's an okay film, but it just can't match James Whale's directing and the gorgeous cinematography from Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. The Ghost of Frankenstein is available on DVD and Blu-ray on the Frankenstein The Legacy Collection, as well as on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below if you would like to check it out. Before we dive into the rest of the films of 1942, if you're enjoying the content, hit like and subscribe for more episodes in the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means the world to me as this channel continues to grow. When H.G. Wells signed over the film rights to Universal, he permitted them to produce as many Invisible Man films as they wanted, and the studio ran with it. Amidst the backdrop of World War II, Invisible Agent was a unique blend of science fiction and wartime spy thriller made by the studio to show off American patriotism and the ways science could be used to fight the war. Directed by Edwin L. Marin, known for his work with stars like John Wayne and Bela Lugosi, the film departed from the horror roots of the original. The cast includes John Hall playing Frank Raymond, the grandson of the original Invisible Man. Hall would go on to star in The Invisible Man's Revenge in 1944. Living under an assumed identity to avoid attention, while holding on to the original invisibility formula, Frank is approached by Axis agents desperate to get their hands on the formula. He refuses their demands, but does give the formula to the United States government in a show of patriotism after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, but he will use the formula only on himself. Frank, now invisible, becomes an undercover agent sent into the heart of Nazi Germany. Once there, he teams up with a spy, Maria Sorensen, played by Ileona Massey. Together, they evade capture and gather crucial intelligence to stop the enemy's plans. The standout, as usual, is Peter Lorre. This time, he plays a menacing Japanese baron. A few months after this film, Lorre will appear in Casablanca, cementing his role in cinema history. Cedric Hardwick appears as Conrad Stauffer, a regular on this channel appearing in Things to Come, The Invisible Man Returns, and in the previous film, The Ghost of Frankenstein. Prominent genre screenwriter Kurt Seedmack penned the script that was originally titled The Invisible Spy. I actually wish they would have stuck with this original title. It just makes more sense for the film. Seed Mac also wrote Invisible Man Returns, The Invisible Woman, and The Wolfman, among many others. The film's use of advanced special effects for its time, including wire work, double exposures, and mat shots, from effects wizards John P. Fulton and Bernard B. Brown, brought Frank's invisible escapades to life on the screen. And the film was nominated for the Best Special Effects Oscar, but lost out to Reap the Wild Wind. Fulton was the special effects guy for Universal Monster Films, working on Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, and The Wolfman. With a budget of $322,000, the film grossed over $1 million, the best out of the Invisible Man sequels. Despite mixed critical reception, the film reflected Hollywood's contribution to the war effort by portraying Nazi and Japanese agents as the enemy. The New York Daily News called it, quote, amusing and exciting, although none of the actors tries to be convincing. While the New York Times and Newsweek were not impressed. 
Sure, it's filled with American wartime propaganda. And Hungarian-born Peter Lorre as a Japanese man wouldn't fly today. Though, he does steal the show. And John Hall is no Claude Rains. What's annoying is that the filmmakers keep changing the rules of how the invisibility serum works in every new movie. It is a movie full of punching Nazis. I do like the spy angle for using the invisibility serum. This would have been an interesting idea to explore in a better script. Invisible Agent is available on DVD and Blu-ray on the Invisible Man collection and streaming on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Two science fiction films made outside the United States dealt with time travel in 1942. One of the earliest films dealing with the subject is Quasier Sideral, or Sidereal Cruises, from director André Zubata, which stands out as an adventurous blend of sci-fi, comedy, and a touch of wartime escapism, filmed in Nazi-occupied France. The film stars Madeleine Solange, who we last saw in 1939's French film The World Will Tremble. She's joined by prominent French actor Jean Marchat and character actor Julianne Carette. The story makes use of time dilation caused by high-speed space travel and is based loosely on Einstein's theory of relativity. Married scientist Robert and Francois prepare for a high-altitude balloon flight in a pressurized gondola. When Robert breaks his leg, his accident-prone assistant takes his place. During the flight, Lucienne accidentally opens a window, causing the balloon to ignite and sending the gondola into space. Francois and Lucienne turn the gondola around and land back safely on Earth. However, due to the effects of time dilation, 25 years have passed on Earth while only a short time for them. It is now 1967. Robert has aged into a gray-haired man while his wife remains young. Francois and Lucienne are now celebrities, and a banker sees the commercial potential of the invention and finances more flights, offering luxury time trips 25 years into the future. On the next journey, this time with Robert and Lucienne, they make their way to Venus, encountering a utopian society of humans. Screenwriters Pierre Gourlay and Pierre Bost brought life to the story. Gourlay, an engineer and writer, brings the scientific aspects to the story. But Gourlay himself would meet a violent end. He was imprisoned after the war for allegedly assisting the Germans, and he would commit suicide in prison in 1945. Produced by Industry Cinemagraphique, the film was made under challenging conditions in Nazi-occupied France. Despite these constraints, the production team managed to create impressive special effects for the time, using rotating sets and miniature models to depict space travel. These type of rotating stages would later be used in Royal Wedding in 1951 starring Fred Astaire and in 2001, A Space Odyssey. One of the film's notable aspects is its subtle commentary on the social and political climate of the time. Although the director avoids specific references to the Nazi occupation, the film's comedic jabs at authority can be seen as a reflection of the era's sentiments. This was a nice change of pace, and I'm glad to see some science fiction made outside the Hollywood factory. It is a fun escapist comedy made on a budget during a difficult time in French history. The costumes and futuristic designs are not that original. In fact, everything in the future in this film is rather garish and sparkly, but they were working on a tight budget. The rotating set design is the standout set piece of the film. Sidereal Cruises is available for streaming on the Internet Archive. There are bootleg DVDs for sale in the United States, but I cannot speak to the quality. The Hungarian film Zirius, or Sirius, is a blend of time travel and fantasy. Directed by Dezu Akash Hamzu, 
This film is based on a short story by Frederick Herzig. The original short story was written in 1894, a year before H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. We meet Professor Sergius, played by Ali Merbalo, in one of his last films. The professor claims to have invented a time machine capable of traveling faster than Earth's rotation, allowing for time travel. The professor offers his daughter's hand in marriage to anyone daring enough to test the machine. Count Tabor Akush, portrayed by popular Hungarian actor Laszlo Szilasi, accepts the challenge. The Count, leaving a costume ball in the present time, travels back to the 18th century. He's mistaken for a distant relative of a wealthy landowner and winds up getting into adventures and romantic entanglements. Zirioche was screened at the 1942 Venice Film Festival and became a hit in Hungary. It's important to take a quick note of the historical context of Hungarian cinema at the time. By 1942, many Hungarian directors, actors, and producers had already fled to the United States, including Michael Curtiz, George Cukor, Bela Lugosi, and Peter Lorre. Those who stayed faced unimaginable consequences. Katalin Karadi, one of Hungary's most popular actresses at the time, plays Rosina, an 18th century singer. In 1944, the actress was imprisoned and tortured for helping Jewish families and allegedly spying for the Allies during the German invasion of Hungary. She would later flee to Switzerland in 1951, but rarely acted in films after the war. Unfortunately, few decent copies of the film are available. I was able to find a poorly recorded copy streaming online. Like the previous film, it's good to see science fiction outside the United States made during the war. It is more fantasy than science fiction once we get past the actual time machine at the beginning of the film. Zeriosh is available on the Daily Motion website and bootleg DVDs in the United States if you would like to check it out. Bowery at Midnight, produced by Monogram Pictures in 1942, is an example of the low-budget films typical of the Poverty Row Studios in Hollywood in the 1940s. A group of smaller studios making B-films for very little money. Monogram Pictures, operating from the 1930s to 1953, was known for their rapid production process. Directed by Wallace Fox, who also helmed The Corpse Vanishes, this year, Bowery at Midnight features Bella Lugosi as both Professor Brenner and Carl Wagner, bringing his signature eerie charm to the dual role of a benevolent soup kitchen operator and a sinister criminal mastermind. This is the first of two films from 1942 that Lugosi made while under contract to Monogram that I'll discuss in this episode. John Archer, who gained fame as the voice of the shadow on the radio after Orson Welles left the program, plays Richard Dennison. He'll later appear in the sci-fi game changer, Destination Moon, in 1950. Wanda McKay portrays Judy, while former boxer Tom Neal takes on the role of Frankie. The film centers on Lugosi, who is a psychology professor by day and a soup kitchen operator at night. He uses his soup kitchen as a front to recruit members for his criminal gang. The plot thickens as Wagner's activities escalate to robbery and murder. And we will later find out that the corpses hiding under the soup kitchen are reanimated by a doctor on Lugosi's payroll. Upon its release, Bowery at Midnight garnered mixed reviews. The Los Angeles Times described it as, quote, maybe the farthest fetched of the Bella Lugosi films, unquote. In some nice marketing, a poster for Lugosi's next film for Monogram, The Corpse Vanishes, appears in the background by a movie theater. The film showcases some cool technology for its time, like a table model of a television receiver hinting at early closed-circuit television. In the end, Bowery at Midnight is an average entry in Bella Lugosi's filmography. 
The reanimation elements are hinted at during the course of the story, but are not really in play until the end of the film. The idea of bringing back the dead was common in mad scientist films of the time, and this film would have worked better if this aspect would have played more of a plot point in the story. Bowery at Midnight is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive if you would like to check it out. The Corpse Vanishes, also produced by Monogram Pictures, is another American mystery horror film with slight science fiction elements. Also directed by Wallace Fox, the film stars Bella Lugosi, this time as Dr. Lorenz, a sinister scientist with a macabre obsession. This was part of Lugosi's nine-picture contract with Monogram. Luana Walters plays journalist Patricia Hunter. Tristam Coffin, known more for his work in westerns and B-films, plays Dr. Foster, a local doctor. The cast also includes Elizabeth Russell as the eerie Countess Lorenz. The Corpse Vanishes begins with a series of bizarre incidents, where brides mysteriously die in the middle of their wedding ceremonies, and then their bodies disappear while being transported to the morgue. Journalist Patricia Hunter investigates these events, leading her to the home of Dr. Lorenz, an eccentric scientist who lives with his wife and odd household staff. Lorenz is abducting the brides to extract glandular fluids, which he uses to keep his wife young and beautiful. While The Corpse Vanishes contains science fiction elements, such as the pseudo-scientific method of extracting youth-preserving fluids from bodies, it is primarily a horror and mystery film. Re-released in 1949, The Corpse Vanishes would eventually gain a cult following. It's also featured in episode 105 of Mystery Science Theater 3000. I do love that Lugosi and his wife sleep side by side in coffins. Patricia is an annoying lead, but I will always give Lugosi films a recommendation. The Corpse Vanishes is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Universal Pictures produced The Mad Doctor of Market Street on a modest budget. Directed by Joseph H. Lewis early in his career, he would go on to later fame for his work in the film noir genre rather than sci-fi or horror. The cast features Lionel Atwell, who we last saw in Son of Frankenstein and Ghost of Frankenstein. This time he plays Dr. Ralph Benson, a brilliant yet unhinged scientist obsessed with discovering the secret to bringing the dead back to life, a common theme in sci-fi at the time. Operating in his secret laboratory on Market Street, Benson's gruesome experiments on unwilling subjects soon attract the attention of police, forcing him to flee San Francisco. Assuming a false identity, he escapes aboard a cruise ship, only for the vessel to encounter a severe storm and he's stranded on a remote South Pacific island. Benson is now stranded with a handful of survivors, and he seizes the opportunity to continue his experiments. Exploiting the islanders' superstitions, he establishes himself as a powerful figure, manipulating their fear and reverence to gain control. Initially titled Terror of the South Seas, the film was shot in just three weeks, a common schedule for B-films at the time. Because of this short production schedule, filmmakers relied on practical rather than special effects. On its release, the film received mixed reviews. The New York World Telegram criticized it harshly, stating it was, quote, a really bad piece of workmanship with a story so bogus, so labored, so dreary, the dialogue so unfunny and the acting so embarrassing that the whole thing is in a class by itself, unquote. The film starts off strong, but once it gets to the island, it falls apart. It's a weird mix of genres that just don't work. They should have kept Atwill in his initial setting instead of sending him into the South Pacific. The Mad Doctor of Market Street is available on DVD and streaming on the Internet Archive. 
Produced by 20th Century Fox, Dr. Renault's Secret was made on a modest budget typical for horror films from that era. The film stars Shepard Strudwick, Lynn Rogers, and J. Carol Nace, a future Oscar nominee who steals the show. George Zuko as Dr. Renault was a British character actor who we've looked at in past films like The Monster and the Girl, and he'll also appear in The Mad Monster later in this chapter. The story follows Dr. Larry Forbes, who travels to a remote French village to visit his fiancée Madeleine, who lives with her uncle, Dr. Robert Renault, a renowned scientist conducting mysterious experiments at his secluded estate. Larry encounters Noel, the doctor's peculiar servant, who exhibits strange, almost animalistic behavior. Larry discovers that Noel was once an ape, transformed into a human through radical and unethical surgical procedures conducted by the mad doctor. When a series of violent murders occur in the village, it leads the locals to suspect Noel. The film's production was influenced by the success of 1941's The Wolfman and looks into themes of transformation and the exploration of what it means to be human. It's hard not to see how this film pulled ideas from the island of Dr. Moreau and the Phantom of the Opera. There was some good set design for a low-budget film, but the plot is slow in the first half. Props to Nace as Noel, who carries the film. Dr. Renault's Secret is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive, and I'll link them in the description below. The Mad Monster is an American horror sci-fi hybrid by Producers Releasing Corporation, a Poverty Row studio known for its low-budget productions. This film is directed by Sam Newfield, a notable B-movie director who made over 250 mostly low-budget films. George Zuko, in his second appearance in this episode, this time plays Dr. Lorenzo Cameron, a scientist ousted from the scientific community due to his radical experiments. Seeking revenge, Dr. Cameron retreats to a secluded location with his daughter to continue his research on creating super soldiers by injecting wolf blood into humans. His current test subject is Petro, the simple-minded gardener who unwillingly transforms into a feral, wolf-like creature with Dr. Cameron's help. The Mad Monster received mixed reviews upon release. The Hollywood Reporter praised the film, noting the production company's success and delivering a compelling thriller. While Variety critiqued its, quote, childish, almost naive attempt to inject horror, unquote, and found the dialogue and situations lacking interest. And the film was also discussed in Mystery Science Theater 3000, Season 1, Episode 3. Compared to Universal's The Wolfman, which was released shortly before The Mad Monster, this had a significantly lower budget. PRC aimed to capitalize on the werewolf trend, but got mixed results. Despite its low-budget nature, The Mad Monster achieved notable transformation effects for its time, relying on practical makeup techniques tailored for black-and-white film. Glenn Strange, as Petro, the victim of the Doctor's experiments, is the standout of the film, bringing humanity to the role. It's a mix of horror, sci-fi technology, and experimentation. The Mad Monster is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. I've linked all films discussed today in the description below if you would like to check them out. In 1942, as the war intensified, science fiction literature transformed. The genre shifted towards war-related themes, serving as allegories for real-world conflicts. Notable works from this year include Robert A. Heinlein's Beyond This Horizon, is a story about a society of genetically engineered superhumans. He also published Waldo in Astounding Magazine under the pseudonym Anson MacDonald. 
which introduces remote manipulators called Waldos. A.E. Van Vogt's short stories, published in astounding science fiction, include Recruiting Station, about interstellar recruitment for a cosmic war, and The Weapon Shop, depicting citizens' defense against a tyrannical government. And Lester Del Rey's Lunar Landing, about humanity's first successful moon landing, capture the era's spirit of exploration. There were a few novels and short stories that were eventually adapted, or concepts from these publications were used in feature films or television series. George Lothar's The Adventures of Superman novel, although not a direct adaptation, helped cement Superman's place in popular culture. Kurt Seedmack, who wrote the screenplays for many films I've discussed, including Invisible Agent, The Invisible Woman, and Nonstop New York, among others, published the novel Donovan's Brain, about a scientist who keeps a brain alive outside its body. It was adapted into several films, including The Lady and the Monster from 1944, Donovan's Brain from 1953, and The Brain in 1962. Isaac Asimov's short stories, Foundation, as well as Bridal and Saddle, were published in the May and June issues of Astounding Science Fiction and explore the rise and fall of civilizations. They were published in novel form in 1951 and have been adapted into a love-it-or-hated television series currently airing on Apple TV. Though never specifically adapted into a film, Asimov's Runaround, published in Astounding Science Fiction's March issue, introduced the three laws of robotics, profoundly influencing both science fiction literature and real-world robotics. This year, the war intensified on multiple fronts. Understanding these events is crucial for examining the science fiction films of the latter 1940s and 1950s. And so for the rest of this episode, I would like to take a look at some historical, cultural, and cinematic events that occurred this year. In Germany, the Von See Conference was held in January and coordinated the final solution. Mass deportations of Jews to extermination camps began, including the first transport of French Jews to Nazi Germany in February. In the Pacific Theater, major developments started with the fall of Singapore to Japanese forces on February 15th. The Pathan Death March in April and the Doolittle Raid on Japan on April 18th highlighted the brutality and expanding scope of the war. The Battle of the Coral Sea in May and the decisive Battle of Midway in June marked turning points in the Pacific, halting Japanese expansion. In North Africa and the Mediterranean, Operation Torch in November saw Allied forces landing in French North Africa, beginning the end of Axis control in the region. On the Eastern Front, the Battle of Stalingrad began in August, initiating one of the war's bloodiest and most pivotal conflicts. The United States experienced significant domestic changes. Executive Order 9066, signed in February, led to the internment of Japanese Americans. March saw the first graduation of African-American pilots from the Tuskegee Flying School. And in May, the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps was established, allowing women to serve in non-combat roles. Artists, writers, and entertainers found innovative ways to express the struggles around the world and provide much-needed escapism. In art and photography, Peggy Guggenheim's Art of This Century Gallery opened in New York City, becoming a beacon for modern art during turbulent times. Edwin Hopper's Nighthawks captured the essence of urban solitude. Lawrence Beale Smith's Don't Let That Shadow Touch Them played a crucial role in rallying support for war bonds. War photography also took center stage with Life magazine bringing the conflict's harsh realities into American homes. And Max Alpert's photograph combat became an iconic image of Soviet resistance. In the realm of comics, superheroes joined the war effort, 
with Wonder Woman making her solo debut in the summer of 1942. After a first short appearance in 1941's All-Star Comics No. 8, she quickly became a symbol of female empowerment and patriotism. In the music industry, Capitol Records was founded, and Bing Crosby's White Christmas became an instant classic. Crosby would perform the song in this year's film, Holiday Inn, co-starring Fred Astaire. Symphony No. 7, Leningrad, by Shostakovich, premiered, embodying the resilience of a besieged city. Literature this year spoke about the existential questions and showcased diverse narratives. Albert Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus explored the absurdity of human existence, while C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters offered spiritual satire. Lloyd C. Douglas's historical novel The Robe was a bestseller, later inspiring a film adaptation in 1953. Little Golden Books launched this year with the pokey little puppy and began a beloved series that would captivate generations. Several scientific and technological advancements driven by the war laid the groundwork for future innovations. In aviation, the Sikorsky R-4, the first mass-produced helicopter, made its first flight on January 14th. It revolutionized aerial transportation and rescue operations. The first successful test of the V-2 rocket on October 3rd was a landmark in rocketry. Developed by Werner von Braun, the V-2 became the first man-made object to reach space. The Manhattan Project was formally established on August 13th to develop atomic weapons. On December 2nd, the first controlled nuclear chain reaction was a turning point in nuclear energy and atomic research. In medicine, the first trials of chemotherapy opened new avenues for cancer treatment and drug development. There were a few technological innovations that affected entertainment and the consumer market. Kodakolor color negative film invented by Eastman Kodak was introduced in January. This was the first mass-produced color negative film for consumers. On August 11th, composer George Antile and actress Hedy Lamarr patented a frequency hopping system to make radio-guided torpedoes harder to detect or jam. This innovation paved the way for secure communication technologies like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Belter Brook operated a closed-circuit television system to monitor V2 rocket launches, marking an early use of television technology for remote monitoring. While initially for military use, it foreshadowed future applications in surveillance. By this time, Hollywood was fully committed to supporting the war. Studios established the Hollywood Victory Committee to entertain troops. The Hollywood Canteen, which opened in October, offered free food, entertainment, and for enlisted men to talk to the stars. Major stars like Clark Gable and James Stewart enlisted, setting an example and inspiring the nation. The Why We Fight film series, which began this year, was a collection of seven propaganda films created by the United States government. Frank Capra, the director behind It Happened One Night and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, served as the creative force behind the series, which was designed to educate Americans on the reason for U.S. involvement in the war. The United States government temporarily forgot about their antitrust lawsuits and Senate investigations into Hollywood's pro-war propaganda in favor of a mutually beneficial partnership to promote the war. The government would conveniently remember these lawsuits after the war ended. Hollywood was rocked this year by the death of Carol Lombard. This beloved actress and wife of Clark Gable was killed in a plane crash on January 16th while returning from a rally to sell war bonds. Her final film, The Dark Comedy, To Be or Not to Be, was released a month after her death. 
The 15th Academy Awards, hosted by Bob Hope, awarded Mrs. Miniver with the Best Picture Prize, directed by William Wyler. This family drama captured the spirit of wartime Britain, focusing on struggles during the conflict. Wyler took home the award for Best Director and star Greer Garson won Best Actress. James Cagney won Best Actor for his portrayal of George M. Cohan in Yankee Doodle Dandy, celebrating American patriotism through song and dance. There was only one nomination for science fiction films this year. Invisible Agent was nominated for Best Special Effects, losing out to Reap the Wild Wind. Due to metal shortages caused by the war, the Oscar statuettes this year were made of painted plaster instead of the usual gold-plated bronze. Though Casablanca technically premiered this year in New York City, it didn't receive a nationwide release until January 1943. So the Academy counted the Bogart and Bergman classic with the films of 1943, where it would go on to win Best Picture. Set during World War II, this romantic drama is about former lovers who reunite in the Moroccan city of Casablanca, a mid-wartime intrigue and would go on to become one of the greatest films of all time. Some popular film serials released this year include Captain Midnight, Spy Smasher, The Secret Code, and King of the Mounties. The popular films of 1942 range from comedies to musicals to sports dramas and include Bambi. This Disney animated classic follows a young deer as he navigates the challenges of growing up in the forest, forming friendships, and facing the dangers of the natural world. Now Voyager. Betty Davis stars in this romantic drama about a repressed woman who transforms her life and finds love after a nervous breakdown. Saboteur. Directed by Alfred Hitchcock, this thriller follows a factory worker, wrongfully accused of sabotage, who embarks on a quest to clear his name and uncover the real enemy. The Magnificent Ambersons. Orson Welles' adaptation about the decline of a wealthy Midwestern family as societal and technological changes sweep through their lives. And finally, Pride of the Yankees. This biographical drama stars Gary Cooper as Lou Gehrig, chronicling the baseball legend's career with the New York Yankees and his courageous battle with ALS. Looking back... It's clear that the sci-fi genre faced challenges and transformations during this pivotal year. Hollywood's shift to a war footing reshaped the industry. But science fiction was still lagging behind because studios were not interested in spending money on these genre films. The films of 1942 showcased some glimmer of ingenuity and creativity of filmmakers working under extraordinary circumstances, especially those in Europe, They adapted their narratives to incorporate contemporary issues while maintaining the imaginative spirit of science fiction. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more history of sci-fi content. And I'd like to give a shout out to my Patreon supporters. Thank you for all the encouragement, and I will see all of you in 1943.